Yo, what's up, peeps? Ambassador here. So, like I promised in the last two episodes, we talked about tone woods and we talked about the different woods that guitars are made out of and the different aspects of those woods and why they sound like they sound. But of course, some of us just want to head to the end of the rainbow, to the good stuff, which is what do the guitars sound like? So what I've chosen to do here to begin with is just, as you guys know, I play a lot of jumbos, right? So as you can hear, we're in New York City. You're going to hear a lot of sirens go on and off throughout these videos. And I don't think we should waste our time trying to avoid the sirens because they're a constant. So I do play a lot of jumbos. You're right. If you've seen us in concert or you've seen pictures, you see me with this guitar all the time. Sometimes a Gibson J200, sometimes an Epiphone SJ or EJ200, sometimes an SJ200, and sometimes a J300. We're going to get to that in a second, but this is a very common jumbo guitar. It is an Epiphone SJ or EJ200. Um, made by the Gibson and Epiphone Company sounds freaking fabulous. This jumbo topped with spruce, all the guitars I'm going to play for you are going to pretty much be topped with spruce and it could be Sitka spruce, Engelman spruce, Adirondack spruce, but it's going to be some type of spruce and that's for the top wood or the sound board. This particular jumbo, this is backed with maple, okay? It also has an arched back, like a lot of the J200s. Maple, as we've explained, it has tight density of grain, and it tends to respond very quick and not sustain for a long time and not give you a lot of overtones. But combined, with the large dimensions of this guitar, it works well. So check it out. Exactly what you would expect from a jumbo, right? get that deep, rich, bassy tone that you expect from a jumbo, and yet somehow they find a way to also incorporate the expression of the higher end, and that's through using maple. Now we're going to show you what I'm talking about right now by just grabbing another jumbo. So this, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's hard to get me to steer away from Gibson or Epiphone J200s. I just absolutely adore them. But this guitar comes damn close. This is one of Guild's jumbos. This one also a Sitka spruce top. But this one, sides and back made out of mahogany. It also has an arched back as well, which means it's going to give more fullness and projection. But listen to the difference. Maple versus mahogany. Listen to that bass.
bass coming out of this guild jumbo is something else, which is why everybody loves guild jumbos. But again, did you notice the difference? You didn't have the focus of as much of the high end and of the treble as you did with a maple backed jumbo. You just didn't. Next up, we're gonna go for another classic. This is something very special. What you have here, ladies and gentlemen, what you have here is Epiphone's EJ300. I believe it's the EJ, it could just be the J. It's the EJ300. What's that, you ask? You know what, that would be a good question because they only made them for one year. 2004. Started producing them in 2003, released them in 2004, stopped production from then on, and that was it. That was the end. And Epiphone tends to do that. You'll also notice with the um, Excellente here, they produced it for just a few years and stopped production for like 50 years. Then they started up production in 2021 for about nine months, and now they're gone. And these guitars will be ever expandingly expensive from here on out, just like the older ones are. Same thing with this EJ300. The idea of the EJ300 was to take their jumbo guitar, the J200, and make the sides in the back out of rosewood instead of maple or mahogany, okay? Now, as we discussed, rosewood, very common wood for guitars a while ago. It kind of stopped. As you notice now, mahogany really has become the top dog. Rosewood, not so much. And that's really due to the fact that we're trying to protect rosewood. That's what it comes down to. But this guitar from 2004 was backed with rosewood. It also, strangely, does not have an arched back like all other J200s, and its dimensions are the same. The lower belt comes in between 16 and a half to 17, but the width of the guitar, normally this is about four and a half, sometimes five, right? This guitar is thinner. Now, we often comment that rosewood has more of a metallic zing to it right and I find that with this guitar too even though it's a jumbo you'll hear the metallic notes of rosewood with this note you can't quite make it out but you recognize immediately that it's not mahogany and that it's not maple this is the EJ 300 one of the only rosewood J 200s that I know of
also got special strings on it too. It has a little bit of a lighter, um, a thinner tone to it because of the strings that I've got specifically on this guitar. Um, but you can definitely hear Rosewood's more metallic zing. It picks up the bass like the charts show it does, but it doesn't have the boom of either of those jumbos. And I think it's partially due to the fact that it's not as wide and it does not have an arched back. Although it is a perfect example of what you get from Rosewood with that metallic nature of it. You still hear the bass, you hear the mids, you still hear the highs, right? All right, next up, what I wanna show you guys is a newer wood on the market, and that is Ovencoll. We know Ovencoll because when Epiphone decided to reissue the Excelente for the first time in 50 years, a limited run production, this is one of them, um, they decided to go with Ovencoll instead of one of the, the more traditional woods like maple, mahogany, or rosewood. And what an incredible choice it was. Of course, as you guys know, a few months later, Taylor decided to release its American Dream series, also backed with Oven Cole. This wood has a very special sound to it. I find it's very similar to mahogany, but it's a little bit lighter, kind of with the metallic zing of rosewood, and yet it still has the warmth and bassiness that you find from mahogany as well. Check this out. Immediately warmer, right? other series where we feature guitars we could talk more about it and where we feature songs and we could play more of this song I was getting carried away because I think this guitar sounds freaking amazing and this is what the tree the wood oven coal sounds like let's get some more guitars made out of oven coal right stop teasing you so you guys have um, hey hopefully heard this guitar and seen this guitar already but um, for this little series that we're doing about tone woods it's important to pull this out because only a few companies have ever done this before and this is Iari we are not worthy before he passed away he did an anniversary edition um, for the Alvarez company in 1980, I believe. And that was this guitar um, out of all Koa wood, okay? So what you hear is 
the characteristic sounds of koa, which are said to be similar to mahogany, which I always find funny when anybody says that about anything. Um, sounds just like mahogany, tastes just like chicken. Kind of a dumb thing to say, really, because if it didn't have its own characteristic sound, we wouldn't be using it. Co has its own special sound, and you'll hear it with this guitar. as much response or responsiveness or expression of the lower end that's just the God's honest truth um, I've got it tuned open to something pretty funky but if we just wanted to hear its responsiveness to bass I love the sound of this guitar. I love uh, writing songs on it. But I would not say that this guitar has a very strong bass or low end presence. It just doesn't. And you know what? Koa is the primary wood used in ukuleles. So the pieces start to fit together in terms of what Koa is used for and what it sounds like. And that's it. I don't think we're gonna get the mahogany or the oven coal or the rosewood bass out of koa, we're just not. They say over time, the koa will open up and get more responsive to bass. Perhaps you've read that. This guitar is 90, 2000, 2010. This guitar is 41 years old. If it hasn't opened up to its bass response yet, it's never going to, let's be honest, right? <laughs> So that sustain. Now, for those of you who are vintage guitars or especially guild guitar fans, you're going to immediately notice this is the classic guild D20. Um, they put it out for a brief period in the 70s, um, attempting, and I believe successfully, to make an all mahogany guitar as opposed to having the top with a traditional white wood or red wood like cedar or redwood or spruce they said what if we also topped the guitar with what's called a dark wood so they made an all mahogany and we primarily know them as the d15s and the d20s this one is from what i remember again we'll explore and experience this guitar in full in an episode just about it um, I believe it's 79, 80, 81, something like that. But you'll really get a chance to hear mahogany. The sustain is fucking phenomenal on this guitar number one. So is the bass response.
listen to the harmonic overtones and listen to the sustain. The real difference being, I mean, we've already played a lot of mahogany backed and sided guitars, but they decided to make an all mahogany guitar, meaning to put that mahogany, that dark wood on top. An incredible invention and just another in a long line of innumerable innovations by the Guild Company. One of the most confusing companies there is. We will do a whole episode just about the storied history and adventures of Guild, the company that moved too much. A lot of people that would find that to be too many harmonic overtones for them. And too bassy as well. I mean, it is, uh, what's, what's the term I'm looking for? It's a, a selective choice, this term I'm looking for. There's gonna be people that are not gonna like this guitar because they're gonna find it too bassy, too muddy. going just keeps going and really that's the difference between what we talked about right the whiter woods spruce cedar redwood the whiter woods that we usually use on top that give you a very quick response snappy bright crisp but then they lack sustain they don't last long either and you want that sometimes with upbeat pop or especially rock songs you want you don't want the guitar to become so muddy and orchestral that it covers up all the other instruments, right? So it really just depends on the song and on the band and, you know, what you're looking for. All right, so this, the only reason I'm including it is because I referenced it several times in the previous two episodes um, about tone woods. And I referenced it specifically because the Yamaha MIJ Red Label Gaki series, whatever you want to call it, the FG180, basically, these guitars are so sought after by musicians. You're basically looking for the Red Label from 66 to 68. It's got the light blue label from 68 to 72, 73. You've got the Red Label. Musicians look for these guitars. Nick Drake recorded three to four songs on his three albums with an FG-180. Even though everybody thinks they know what guitar Nick Drake used just because he was posing with the guitar in that one picture and that guitar didn't even belong to him. It belonged to the photographer. You guys need to give up the Guild Nick Drake guitar myths. Move on to reality. Too many guys in the studio saw him recording with the Yamaha FG-180 and heard what he said about it. Now, for me, the first time I heard it, I was like, what the hell is that? I knew I wanted it, okay? But did I know it was going to lead to that?
rings out. You hear those harmonic overtones that are like an octave higher than the notes that I've actually played. They're like bells being played an octave higher. Incredible. Now, let's just say for the record, this guitar is known to be spruce top and mahogany back and sides. Some theories say that it's laminate. Other theories say that because they were trying to directly compete with their American competitors and create a real brand of guitar. Remember, the, F, the FG series is Yamaha's first professional foray into making guitars mass market. Before that, they were OEM contract manufacturers for the American companies. Then they come out with the first FG series, it stands for folk guitar, um, the FG 180, and it's called, it's nicknamed the uh, Guitar of a Thousand Gold Records because when it came out, every artist in the world started using it and had gold or platinum albums all through the 70s. What I love about it, um, I'm not playing you a different tone wood, I'm playing you spruce with mahogany. What I love about it is whatever the hell they did do, to this guitar. They created a guitar that offers incredible harmonic overtones, the likes of which I still have not been able to find in another guitar, except the Hofner 491, and that's the one all the way over on the end. But that one makes sense that it has all those harmonic overtones because it doesn't have a traditional bridge and saddle. Instead, it has a giant hunk of metal that the strings are hooked to. So you can understand the bell-like quality and the harmonic overtones you get from that guitar. But from this, spruce with mahogany, I don't know, folks. But I'll tell you what, if you ever see one of these for sale, regardless of the price, you get one. You're going to know it because it's got that red label and because it says FG180. Evidently, there are some um, pretenders who come along and take newer Yamahas and they buy these red labels and they try to slap it in there. Um, I did a lot of research into the guitar before I got it um, to make sure that I was getting the real thing. That would be important. All right, so this is going to be our extra credit guitar, sort of, but in reality, this is an episode specifically where we're playing as many guitars as we can with different woods or tone woods so you can hear what the difference in its sound is so this is the newest yamaha fg series i believe it's the yamaha fg 800 it is it's the yamaha fg 800 this guitar literally showed up on our doorstep um through ups either earlier this year or last year because Yamaha had just come out with it. Um, it's their 50th anniversary of the FG series and um, wanted me to hear it and play it for you all. Now, what they did, number one, is they stuck to their dedication to keeping guitars affordable. It is not an expensive guitar. They also wanted it to still sound like the Yamaha FG series. What they did is they used Sitka Spruce on the top backed with a wood called nato but then we learned that there's no such thing as a nato tree nato wood comes from the african mora tree so this is spruce backed with wood from the mora tree and uh it is interesting to listen to let's listen first and then decide what we think of this tone wood response plenty of mid-range 
Listen to those overtones. You hear that? It's like an octave higher. Almost like organ notes are sustaining off the guitar. Again, maybe something very specific to the construction and what they put into the shape and size of the FG series of guitars. But I can't fault this guitar. Now, again, this is not um, your classic hit quick and fade out quick uh, guitar that you would use in popular music simply because it is big sounding. It is kind of fat sounding. It does take a minute to hit and get really big and take a long time to sustain. You wouldn't want to use it with a band for a pop song, but would you want to use it in a slower song where there's a ton of instruments and you're trying to create a wall of sound, a huge wall of sound? Hell yeah. African Mora tree. You can hear all the highs that you want. You can hear the mid range, chimey, bell like, and you get that bass response out of it as well. Imagine that. And this is a guitar that's probably two or three hundred dollars and it sounds great so for any guitar snobs out there that think that you got to spend 32 to 3600 dollars on a guitar they're crazy and by disseminating that information to others they're also just irresponsible i don't know a musician or a professional someone who's professional in the industry who's a guitar snob who gives a shit what a guitar costs it's all about the sound. So what we have here is a 1972 Gibson Gospel a guitar specifically made by Gibson to take advantage of the evangelical Christian movement that was sweeping the nation after flower power turned out to not be so pretty and lovey-dovey after the Stones were responsible for killing like two to eight people by the Hells Angels at the Altamont Music Festival, All right? So, of course, as humans are wont to always do, they turn to religion. Gibson thought to themselves, hey, we need to get on uh, that religious fervor movement. So they came out with a guitar called the Gibson Gospel, put a dub on the headstock. Now, why are we playing it? playing it is simple. What Gibson decided to do with the Gibson Gospel is two very interesting things. Number one, the top of course is spruce, but they decided to make it an arched back, which is super cool and badass. That's why it's got that deep bassiness and that fullness that you hear. And yet the sides and the back are maple. So it has that projection that maple offers us that responsiveness to the high end so think about that we've we've seen it done with other guitars now right um like with epiphones sj200 where they create a bigger guitar with an arched back and then they balance out that fullness and that bassiness with maple wood or you could reverse it and say they balance out the 
high tones and the trebliness of maple with a larger guitar with an arched back. Either way you look at it, it's um, pretty cool. So that's going to be created by the size of the guitar and by the arched back. And yet, it also projects well because it's made of maple. And, um, you know, look, the Gibson Gospel is probably one of my least favorite Gibson models, but it still sounds great. And it has a relatively broad frequency spectrum. You can hear it. You hear the bass. You hear the mid-range. You hear the highs. So... You're not kicking it out of bed, that's for sure. So check it out. Right now, that's about it in terms of playing you guitars that are composed of different tone woods. There's another thing that we can do, um, which is this. Play guitars based on size, and also play guitars based on what the nut and saddle are composed of. Believe it or not, it makes a big difference in sound. But I don't know how many guitars we used. We used quite a few. We showed you a variety of different guitars um, made of different tone woods. Hopefully you heard differences. You can take notes and decide which ones you like the best and which tone wood you think fits your style of writing and your style of music making. That way you'll know what you're looking for and you'll know what to buy. All right, ambassador out as always. Thanks for watching.